E-safety is something we hear a lot about these days. We hear about it at work, we hear about it at home, and of course we hear about it in the media. But all these concerns aren't always translated into actual action. Like health and safety, e-safety is often seen as a bureaucratic problem, something that gets in the way of day-to-day -day life. However, e-safety is actually a really important topic, and here's why. E-safety isn't something we can just leave for somebody else. It's all of our responsibilities and duties. We have a moral duty to our staff, our learners and ourselves to make sure that standards don't slip. We've got a legal duty towards vulnerable learners and also towards the reporting systems that are in place. And Ofsted require us to make sure our learners are aware of e-safety. In fact, it's now a limiting grade making it an essential part of any Ofsted inspection. In their Common Inspection Framework, Ofsted makes several references to the importance of learners understanding the use of internet safety measures. The word safety can be confusing. It's about being responsible. The dangers that are out there don't just affect the vulnerable, they affect everyone. So we have a responsibility to ensure protection for those most at risk, while all the time behaving responsibly ourselves. This responsibility isn't just limited to our time at work. How we act in public on the internet outside of work is also a matter for our personal and professional responsibility. There are various different options for tackling this. The first is a lockdown approach where nobody can access anything. Recent studies show that this can do more harm than good. The other option is to give open access. Of course, this has its own problems to infrastructure. So once again, responsibility is key, allowing flexible use of learning resources while being safe. I'm joined now by Professor Sonia Livingstone from the London School of Economics, who's uh, an executive member of the UK Council for Child Internet Safety and recently published Risks and Safety on the Internet, the Perspective of European Children. Professor, many people see e-safety and other measures such as health and safety as bureaucratic processes rather than something that needs to be taken seriously. Is e-safety something they need to be thinking about? It is something people should be uh, seriously thinking about, yes. And uh, I think the analogies of other kinds of safety are interesting. Uh, road safety is the one that's usually used. Of course, we teach people quite young about road safety, though they learn to drive cars when they're adults, so it's a continued process. Um, and health safety, food safety, you know, there's a variety of other analogies. Uh, the internet is part of our lives and part of everything that many of us now do, and safety is part of that activity. Safety from what, though? What sort of um, risks are out there? Well, we, in our research, we've been trying to make a distinction between risk and harm. Uh, there are many of the things that people uh, worry about are out there, in fact, pretty well every... Uh, problematic, bad criminal activity in society is on the internet and probably more accessible there, though not necessarily more uh, frequent. Uh, we should really be concerned about what harms people and what upsets people, and that's only a subset of what's out there, and that's one of the difficult things to negotiate. So there are many things out there we come across some of it and we are um, upset or harmed by only some of that. Uh, and then I would say exactly what kinds of harms. Um, that really differs for different groups and by age and um, what younger people uh, might be upset or bothered by on the internet isn't always what um, adults think they're going to be uh, concerned about and what worries and upsets older people and adults is different again from younger children. So if there are these criminals out there, isn't um, a lockdown or strict filtering system the best answer? I think it's an understandable answer uh, in a context where schools and colleges have a duty of care and not necessarily all the uh, resources and time to address uh, how that duty of care might pan out in people's leisure time and what they're doing on their phones and internet which is very hard to monitor. So I think it's understandable but I think it's deeply problematic and of course the challenge is to find a way of embedding safety in our ordinary practice without stopping people get the benefits of the internet.
So in other other parts of you know other parts of the curriculum, other parts of learning practice, we are encouraging children and young people, indeed everybody, to go online as the first port of call for all kinds of information. So it is deeply problematic then to worry about to restrict that entirely in terms of safety. You say deeply problematic. Are you referring to your research finding that many children felt they could be more genuine online than offline? I'm, I'm very struck by that finding because it was around about half of the 9 to 16 year olds said they felt they could be more themselves online and then about a quarter said they like to talk about um, more intimate things or more private things online than they do with people face to face. And it just points us to both the way the way the risks and opportunities go really hand in hand, because the internet for many young people is a fantastic new opportunity to manage relationships and manage intimacy and privacy in a way that is really quite hard offline. And most young people find, um, you know, various kinds of interactions potentially embarrassing and sort of there's a chance of losing face and putting a foot in it, and it can be difficult. So. Just having a bit of a delay in communication, having a slightly kind of jokey environment in which things can be said and then retracted or, you know, there's a bit of time to respond, uh, seems to many a wonderful opportunity. But if people are saying more intimate things and more private things online than they are offline, clearly it's an opportunity for the vulnerable to be um, on occasions exploited. So if there are these benefits coupled with risks, what should colleges and other providers be doing? Promoting digital literacy? I, I absolutely think they should be encouraging di digital literacy themselves. Uh, it's not that they are then taking the responsibility away from the parents, and ideally schools would be working with parents, but when we ask both children and parents where they would like to get their information and safety advice from, schools is the number one place. I mean, it just seems accessible, it seems a context that understands children, it seems a context that will be uh, up to date with the latest information. So. You know, teachers might not always feel they've got the time to be up to date, but there are lots of resources that uh, can be made available to teachers and then disseminated to um, parents and children. And the other thing I'd add is the importance of embedding this kind of information in across the curriculum so that it's not um, a special subject, you know, oh yes, we did a lecture on that and then we move on and forget about it. It's a matter of being aware that there are safety issues when children um, look up any kind of information or when they create their own content and it could be in different subjects, it could be in different classes, but it, there should just always be um, some sensitivity to the safety aspect, not necessarily making it focal, but you know, just as if we tell children to travel in their physical environment, we might offer a bit of safety advice at the same time as encouraging them to go out. So it's about making sure learners know what to do. We ask children when they had been upset by something online, what did they do? And then we ask them whether what they did helped. And they tried a range of strategies, but those who blocked somebody and who was upsetting them and those who then deleted the messages that had been um, bothering or upsetting them in some way. So that was the most helpful thing to do. And, um, you know, some just said, I don't know what to do. And they turned off the internet and went away for a while. And that's helpful only in a kind of catastrophic way. Uh, and they tried various other things that were less successful. So I think everyone knowing how to block someone, how to delete messages is really crucial. Your research applies to children, but how does this translate into providers working with older learners? Well, I think there are different risks at different age groups. Um, some things will continue across the age range in different forms. So something like cyberbullying, which has become a really big concern, though thankfully not a huge number of children in the survey said they'd experienced it. But one can imagine that would um, operate a bit differently at different ages and also the kinds of interventions might be different. So you can talk to older, um, you know, you can talk to young adults in a different way. You can certainly talk to young adults about sexual matters in a different way. And one of the things parents struggle with with the younger children is that they might be seeing pornography or sexual messages before the parents have even or teachers have begun to have those conversations with them. Uh, on the other hand, I think we are sometimes uh, a little complacent in thinking that once they're older, they, they've got it sorted, they know more than us, they're already the tech-savvy young people, and there are some other risks that face younger, young adults. So we see among 
teenage girls, for example, quite high rates of going to pro-anorexia sites, which is not something you might need to raise with a nine-year-old, but I think should be raised with a 15-year-old. And we had about one in five who had been to such sites. Um, some of the race-hate sites, some of the more extreme kinds of pornography sites. You know, those are things we could be discussing with young adults, uh, and I think we should be. So in terms of information skills, how can we help learners distinguish between sites that are legitimate for research and support um, and those that are just harmful? It, it isn't possible to simply divide the sites and one reason is that a number of those sites are kind of user-generated content and they're, um, they're a community that is trying to help but might be trying to help to make you very thin and it might be trying to help to um, for you to recover from anorexia and the same kinds of conversations could be going on in the one site or the same kind of advice could be sensible and helpful for some people and problematic for others uh, and it's um, very hard to draw that line so in the, and we have very little research on it so I guess in the first instance we should be looking at those sites with young people if they um, you know in some kind of context and discussing what kinds of things go on. Well, it seems there's roles in promoting the safety for information skills and support staff, as well as those teaching directly. Professor Livingston, thank you very much. The Regional Support Centre are ideally placed to help you develop a policy which ensures that learners and staff are protected while giving them flexible access to the data and web applications. A document like this is essential if teaching and learning is to take place and everyone is to remain safe. Putting together a strategy doesn't have to be difficult, it's just about making sure the right people are included. This includes clear lines of reporting and responsibility, so that everybody knows who's responsible for making what decision. The conduct policy is also important, so that staff, learners and any other parties know where they stand before an issue might occur. And a clear risk assessment of all the risks involved in e-safety, not just risks to the person, but also risks to the business. It's also important to look at the partners you work with and how you assess their policies to make sure that they're in line with your best practice. So how do you go about setting up an e-safety strategy and policy? Well, the first step is to set up a task group, a group or person interested in e-safety and management issues. The next step is to link to existing policies. You don't want to reinvent the wheel here. If you already have a bullying policy, you don't need a cyberbullying one. The e-safety policy just needs to cross-link to the existing ones, so it's worth taking some time to have a look at what's already there and what needs to be rewritten and updated. It's important everyone's included in this. All your partners will have to comply with the policy, so let's make sure they understand it and contribute to it. And it's important, of course, that it's a flexible, non-lockdown policy. One thing's for certain, e-safety is an issue that isn't going away and is going to be with us for some time yet. The Regional Support Centre will continue to help management and middle management tackle the issues through workshops, through policy development and through an interactive tool. If you want any more help now, you can email our support line at support at rsc-yh.ac.uk or you can phone our support line on 0113 343 1000. But from me, that's all for today. Till next time, goodbye.